Hilton, if you are going to read from a physical Bible today, which you're more than welcome to do, we're going to mostly be in 1 Peter chapter 4. So towards the back of the, towards the, back of the New Testament there, 1 Peter chapter 4. And again, with the, with the small kids, sorry we don't have a nursery today. We didn't have uh, enough volunteers for that today. But don't worry about noises that kids make. It's all totally fine. Now, with that being said, let me ask you this. If a random person out on the street came up to you and asked you to do something really difficult or inconvenient, like say, for example, they came up and asked you to come and clean out their gutters, or maybe they asked you to come tuck them in with a warm blanket, or maybe they asked you to do something like donate a kidney to them, or to go out and buy feminine products for them. What would you say if they asked you to do that? Well, I think generally speaking, we would say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that for you. I don't know you. Why would I do those things for a stranger? There's no way that most of us would do most of those things. However, if your wife asked you to do those things, it would be a totally different story, wouldn't it? If your wife, who you love, to whom you have made a vow, asked you to do just about any of those things, you should do them probably without any kind of hesitation. Now, you might not like it, but you would do it. Because of your great love and your allegiance to your wife, you would go so far as to clean out the gutters. You would tuck her in with a, with a warm blanket. You would donate a kidney to her. You may even, God forbid, end up staring wildly as the feminine products aisle, looking carefully to make sure you get her brand. It's embarrassing, it's humiliating, but you would do it because in your mind, hopefully, she is worth it, right? She is worthy of your sacrifice. You would suffer those things for her. Now, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about that topic, the topic of suffering. And as people living in this world, as we have talked about, we all suffer, we all hurt. We will find ourselves in terribly painful situations, far worse things than most of the stuff that your wife asks you to do. And the idea behind this series is to help to equip you with a biblical view of suffering so that when you do face the variety of enormous challenges that this life has to offer, you can face them with spiritual maturity. We talked the first week about the source of suffering, which is sin. In all kinds of ways, we suffer the consequences of living as sinners in a sin-broken world. And we discussed the Christian approach to suffering is this. We blame sin for the suffering that we endure, and we trust God through it. Then last week, we talked about some of the reasons that we can trust God through suffering. We discussed the idea of rejoicing even in suffering because suffering is accomplishing something within us. It is for a purpose. God takes what is meant for evil and he turns it to good. He is able to allow what he hates to accomplish what he loves. He utilizes suffering in our lives to develop endurance in us, to prove our character like we talked about last week, and to reinforce the hope that we have in him. As painful as suffering may be, we should begin to see it as an opportunity for us to grow in our relationship with God. Then last week, in our time of thoughts, questions, and clarifications, someone brought up this conversation where they asked, what if we are suffering directly because of our allegiance to God? What if we are suffering for Jesus? What if we're suffering because of our faith in Christ? And of course, we understand that God permits us to suffer, that he's able to help us to work through it. But there's this more difficult biblical truth the truth that faithfulness to God sometimes actually results in suffering. In other words, the call of the Christian is, in some ways, a call to suffer. So the question is, what if God calls us to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ? Just like your commitment to your wife, sometimes your commitment to Christ will lead you to do things that you would not normally wish to do. Following Jesus and living in obedience may lead directly to a path of suffering. But for the same reason that you would do those things for your wife, 
because of your love for her, your commitment to her, because she is worthy of it, the answer for the Christian should be the same. If I am to suffer for the name of Jesus, then I will do so even joyfully because I believe him to be worth it. Christians are thrown headlong into suffering because of their association with Jesus, and we are meant to endure it with joy. So as, as I said, today we're going to focus on 1 Peter chapter 4, but before we get to that, I did want to highlight some of the teachings of Jesus himself on this topic. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 to 22. Listen carefully. He says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men. For they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. <clears throat> for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus' message is harsh but clear. You, as a follower of Jesus, will be hated for his name. You will be delivered over to courts. You will be arrested. You will be questioned and beaten. Brother will turn his brother over to death. Children will rise against parents and parents against their children. All for what? For his name's sake. And we ask ourselves the question, as Jesus gives this difficult teaching, why on earth would any of his followers stick around after this? And even more specifically, why on earth would you stick around and follow Jesus after he says these things? The answer is simple. He is worth it. His name is worth it. His salvation is, without a doubt, worth every ounce of suffering that you may endure because of his name. Now, Peter, who wrote the letter that we're going to be examining today, undoubtedly heard this teaching from Jesus. He was there, and his faith in this way would soon be put to the test. Many of you know that Peter, after Jesus' crucifixion, was asked, do you associate with that name? Do you know this Jesus? Aren't you one of his? And what does Peter do in that moment? Under just a minor amount of pressure from the crowds, when he is tested in this way, Peter denies knowing Jesus Three times in a row, just as Jesus predicted that he would, Peter denied Jesus. He forsook the name of Jesus Christ. However, fortunately for us, after Jesus' resurrection, Peter turned around dramatically. He learned from his failures, which makes this passage from the letter of 1 Peter that we're examining today all the more remarkable. This letter was written by Peter some 30 years or so after his denial of Christ. And in that time, not only had the church experienced exponential growth, but as we talked about last week, they had also endured much suffering as well. And when tested over and over, Peter and many others proved their willingness to suffer for the name of Jesus. And this is what Peter has to say about it. Look at 1 Peter, look at chapter 4, verse 12. This is what Peter now that he's turned around from his time, time of denial and spent 30 years suffering for the name of Jesus, this is his encouragement to other believers. He says this. <clears throat> Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Peter's message to his fellow Christians here is very clear. Don't be surprised when you face fiery trials. Don't be shocked when you, as a direct result of your faith in Jesus, face tremendous pain. What a dark bit of expectation management coming from Peter here. And we should understand this truth. The first blank on your handouts this morning is this. We should expect 
to suffer for the name of Jesus. We should expect it. When a person is truly, faithfully, obediently following Jesus, suffering is the norm, not the exception. We should expect it. Now, Peter's choice of words here is really interesting. Our translation read, he said, do not be surprised at the fiery trial. Now, the original Greek that we translate as the fiery trial is sometimes translated as the fiery ordeal among you. Or the more literal translation would be the among you burning. Now, there's a chance that as we read that, we can interpret it like we talked about last week, that we understand suffering in general to be something that refines us. Like we talked about before, the furnace of affliction hardens us like steel or refines us like silver. That's one interpretation of this passage. <clears throat> but while we don't know this for sure, there's also a chance that Peter could be referencing something very specific from Christian history. You see, we believe this letter of 1 Peter to have been written around the time <clears throat> of what is called the Neronian Persecution. Rome had an emperor named Nero, who you may have heard of before, and Nero hated Christians. He hated the message of Christianity because it went against the state of Rome. He wanted Rome to be understood as the authority over all things and himself as the emperor to be the supreme authority. So people ascribing their hearts to the authority of God through Jesus Christ is unacceptable to him. And in his hatred of Christians, this is what happened. In the year 64 AD, there was a massive fire that destroyed a huge portion of the city of Rome. So Nero sees this as an opportunity to blame Christians for the fire. Because if they can be scapegoated for this, then he has a reason to kill them. And then what Nero did in response to this was that he would take any Christians that they could find... And we know from historical documents that this is true. He would put them up on poles and light them on fire to be torches at night. Living Christians lit on fire to light the way in Rome. So when we read Peter say, around this time, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, the among you burning. He may specifically be referencing other Christians that he knew or other people that his people knew of that were literally put on top of poles burning. You can see an example of this on the screen. This is a painting from long ago that, it, that shows exactly this. They put people on poles and burned them. There was a fiery ordeal among them. Because they claimed the name of Jesus, Christians were being burned to death. And what is Peter's response to this? What is the encouragement that he offers? He says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if you are taken from your home, tied to a pole, and set on fire because of your faith in Jesus. Expect it. You will suffer. You will be hated for his name's sake. It's a harsh message, isn't it? Consider what James says in James chapter 4, verse 4. James explains, he says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We understand this very clearly. God and sin are opposed to one another. They do not mix. This world, at least for now, belongs to sin. And for that reason, God and sin are enemies. And here's the thing, we're not just a friend of God, we are adopted and purchased and bought by the blood of Jesus. We are made new by him. So do not be surprised when that results in the world hating you, because this sinful world hates him. It is his enemy. And if we belong to him and the world belongs to sin, then we should expect to be enemies of the world. Now, in our, in our modern Christian culture, I'm afraid this often gets missed. Believe me when I say this. The gospel is good news. Following Jesus is a good thing. It is the right step to take. We are saved by Christ and we are given new life and supernatural peace and abundant joy. And I wouldn't trade my faith in Jesus for anything. But we can't forget the other side of this. It also leads us to be enemies of the world. 
This is why you'll hear me pretty often speak against what's called the prosperity gospel, right? Where churches are preaching that if you follow Jesus, that everything in your life is going to be made right, that your problems are going to be solved, that you're going to suddenly become healthy and wealthy if you sow that seed of faith. That is false because it is antithetical not only to the message of the New Testament, but to the experience of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of Christians that have lived before us. Following Jesus lives or makes us live in suffering. We are not in this world. We are enemies of this world because this world belongs to sin. But this is the good news of the gospel. Jesus has overcome this broken world. The good news of the gospel is not that we get everything good in this world. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus overcame it. The world will hate you because of him. But he will never cease to love you. Puritan theologian Jonathan Edwards says this. You'll see the quote on the screen. He says, as love to God prevails, it tends to set persons above human injuries. In this sense, the, that the more they love God, the more they will place all their happiness in him. They will look to God as their all and seek their happiness in his portion and in his favor, and thus not in all the allotments of his providence alone. The more they love God, the less they set their hearts on their worldly interests, which are all that their enemies can touch. Our hope, our joy, our happiness is meant to be tied up in him and him alone. And if he is our greatest love, then the loss of all other things in this world should hurt us much less. All that our worldly enemies can touch are the things of this world. But our hope is beyond this world. That's the idea that Peter is getting at. Don't be surprised when you suffer for his name. Expect it. And like we talked about last week, we can even rejoice in it, which is why Peter goes on to say this in verses 13 to 14. Peter says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We can know this for sure. Jesus suffered. Even though he knew no sin, this sinful world caused him to suffer. He was hated, rejected, and even killed, though he did nothing wrong ever. The Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet, um, says this in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, describing Jesus. He says he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. That is the truth of Jesus' experience. Jesus suffered. But he didn't just suffer in the past. Jesus suffers even now as his followers suffer. In the book of Acts, we see the story of Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, a hater of God. He wanted to turn people against Jesus. He did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He was fighting against the movement of the church until Jesus appears to him personally. And as Jesus appears to Paul personally, he says this, and it's very important for us to understand. Jesus says to Paul, why are you persecuting me? Now, this is what we understand. Jesus had years before <clears throat> died, been buried, was raised again, and ascended into heaven. Jesus' time on earth was done. And yet he says to Paul, why are you right now persecuting me? Now, what we take from that is this. <clears throat> As Christians suffered, Jesus continues to suffer along with them. The persecution that Paul inflicted on other people was still being inflicted upon Jesus. Paul was persecuting him by persecuting believers. So the biblical idea is this, the next blank on your sheet, is that we joyfully share in Jesus' sufferings because he shares in ours. Jesus fully identifies with our suffering. We aren't enduring it alone. When we live in his name and suffer as a result, he suffers with us. And his glory is revealed as we share in his sufferings. There is nothing that we will endure for his sake that he doesn't fully identify with. Back in 1977, 
which is really not all that long ago, um, there was a Christian in Romania named Josef Song. Romania at the time was thoroughly and oppressively communist. And yet Yosef, against all odds, was able to travel the country and share the gospel with many, many people. He was spreading the gospel in communist Romania. And for that reason, the secret police of Romania sought to end him. So he recalls one meeting that he had with a secret police officer. They invited him to come and have a meeting with him, and they offered him a deal. They said, Mr. Son, we'll offer you this deal. Either you can take a normal job and never preach the gospel again, never say the name of Jesus again, and you can live. <clears throat> or if you don't take this deal, we'll kill you. This is what Yosef said to them. He said, you said you were going to finish me as a preacher. I asked my God, and he wants me to continue to be a preacher. Now, I have to make one of you two angry, and I decided it was better to make you angry than God. It's a pretty bold stance to take, right? And at that meeting, the secret police officer said, you know what? If your faith is something that you're willing to die for, then you should have it. And they let him go free. And for four more years, Yosef continued to do ministry in communist Romania under constant threat of death. And later on, he was being interrogated once again for who knows how many times. He was being interrogated again about his faith. And this is what he said to the interrogator. He said, you should know... Your supreme weapon is killing, but my supreme weapon is dying. That's a bold stance to take. Now, in his book, describing this whole ordeal in Romania, Son says this. You'll see the quote on your screen. He says, this union with Christ is the most beautiful subject in the Christian life. It means that I am not a lone fighter here. I'm an extension of Jesus Christ. When I was beaten in Romania... He suffered in my body. It is not my suffering. I only have the honor to share his sufferings. When you suffer for the sake of the name of Jesus, you do not suffer alone. You do not suffer for nothing. You suffer with him and he with you. And it is an honor because it reveals his glory. You'll be glad to know Yosef Son is still alive today, still doing ministry in Romania, which is no longer communist, and he is free to do so because he remained faithful to his call in the Lord. Let's look back at those two verses from 1 Peter chapter 4 once more. The same verses we just read, verses 13 to 14, say this, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So according to this, what does suffering for Jesus amount to? It amounts to his glory revealed. It results in blessing because it is yet another example of the spirit of God being upon us. If we suffer for his name's sake, we know for sure that he is at work, that he's doing something. As Peter described in verse 14, when we are insulted for his name's sake, it's only happening because his spirit is upon us. The more we represent and display Jesus, the more we can expect to suffer. So the more we suffer, the more we can be assured that we're actually doing the right thing, that we're actually representing Christ well. And here's the big thing to remember that's really difficult sometimes. When and if you are rejected or insulted because of your faith in Jesus Christ, try to remind yourself it is not a rejection of you as a person. It is a rejection of him. It is not an insult of you as a person. It is an insult towards him. Oftentimes, it's really hard to separate these things because insults feel personal. Rejection feels personal. It feels bad when people don't like us. But if they don't like us because of our faith in Christ, if they're rejecting us because we stand for the truth, then try to remind yourself, it is not a rejection of you, it is a rejection of him. They hate you because they hate God. They oppose you before, because they oppose God. And we should be reminded from this passage in 1 Peter, this simple point. Suffering for Christ is a privilege, 
not a penalty. That's the next blank on your handouts. Is suffering for Christ is a privilege, not a penalty. Remember, our eyes and hearts and minds are set on something much bigger than the things that we endure here on this earth. And as much as Christians have suffered in their lives throughout history, they have done so because there is no one else they would rather stand with. There is no other name that they would rather be associated with. There is no other cause worthy of their sacrifice than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is an honor to stand with him, even when men dishonor us. It is an honor to stand with Jesus, even at gallows or in prisons or in front of firing squads or on funeral pyres. Suffering for Christ is a privilege, not a penalty. And this is why Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6, 16 to 18. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What Jesus is doing within us now and for us in eternity is worth it. He is worthy of our suffering. Why? Because in the light of his glory, all that we will endure on this earth, no matter how grim, all of it will seem light and momentary. All affliction will be a distant, fading memory. The things that feel like the biggest deal to us now are temporary. But what God is preparing for us in eternity lasts forever. And that eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison will make all of your suffering here feel like absolutely nothing. The prophet Isaiah, speaking about the end times and what God will do in forever, says this in Isaiah chapter 65 verse 17. God says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. All of this suffering, all of this pain, especially any suffering that you endure for his name's sake, all of it will be forgotten. It will not come to mind. That's the glory that awaits us in Christ. So yes, suffering for him now is a privilege, not a penalty. It is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Look back at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, says this. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Here, Peter is simply explaining that we cannot respond to suffering by sinning. It would be wrong to be sinned against for the name of Jesus and then for us to retaliate with more sin. There is shame in being a murderer. There is shame in being a thief. There is shame in suffering for doing evil or even for meddling in other people's business. But there is no shame in suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. So when you face persecution by men or when you are rejected by people, while you may feel compelled to retaliate, that is a shameful reaction. He's trying to teach us that we can't undo the sins of others done against us by sinning back against them. So if someone tries to have you killed for your faith, Peter's saying, look, don't murder them in retaliation. That is a shameful response. If someone ruins your livelihood because of your association with Jesus, you are not permitted to then steal to make things right. That is a shameful response. That's one of the dimensions of what Peter is saying here. But the second dimension is this. The hatred that will come from sinful people towards Christians will make you want to feel ashamed. You will want to feel ashamed because of the things that you are suffering for Christ. And what Peter says is this, don't. When these shameful things come upon you, when people sin against you and wrong you, when you hurt because of your association with Jesus Christ, do not be ashamed for following him. 
I think about this sometimes, like what, what would it be like to be in a country like Romania, like Yosef Son was, and be arrested for my faith? What would I feel like if I was taken away in handcuffs for no other reason than for preaching the gospel? My gut feeling tells me that if that were to happen to me, I would feel pretty ashamed. It would be embarrassing. Imagine my neighbor seeing me let off in handcuffs and put into a police car. That would feel shameful, right? But this is what Peter is telling us. Even if those sorts of things happen to you, do not be ashamed for trusting and following the name of Jesus Christ. That's the last mic on your sheets this morning. Do not be ashamed when you suffer for his name's sake. This is what we know for sure. While we are not currently under serious, life-threatening persecution at this time in our country, we do right now face increased shaming for our beliefs. More than any other time in my life, Christians who hold to the normal, orthodox, traditional, historical, biblical standard for morality are being publicly vilified for having those beliefs. For simply believing what Christians have believed for millennia, people are being called bigots or foes. For holding to the biblical standard for things like marriage or gender or life or sexuality in particular, Christians are and will be brutally and publicly shamed. We are treated somehow as the transgressors for simply adhering to the truth and standing for our faith. And if or when it results in things like being ridiculed or derided publicly or being sent to jail or carted off to camps or even executed, as much as you may feel like you should be ashamed in those moments, the message of the gospel is this. Do not be ashamed for standing in the truth. Do not be ashamed for suffering in his name. Instead, glorify him all the more. Again, we know this for sure. The worst punishment that the world can offer is to take away your life. But your eternal life is firmly within his grasp. The boos and the jokes and the jeers and the shaming of our culture will all fade away. They will be silenced by our God who has the final word. And in the end, that feeling of shame will no longer be remembered or even come to mind. So do not be ashamed for standing with our God. We'll skip down to verse 19 to close this up for today. This is what Peter says. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Ladies and gentlemen, do not entrust your souls to a culture and a world that hates you and hates God, no matter how loud and insistent they may be. Do not succumb to a world that has it filled itself with manufactured shame. Entrust your soul to your faithful creator. We can absolutely expect to suffer for his name's sake here on earth, but we can endure it and even rejoice in it because this we can know for sure. Our God is worthy of our suffering. Whatever we suffer for his name's sake by doing good, without a doubt, will be completely worth it. Let's pray as we close for the day. God, it is a fearful thing to live in a place and a time where we might suffer for your name. God, we have lived very peacefully for a very long time with very much freedom, and we're thankful for that. But God, let it not soften us so that we are unable to face trouble and trial and punishment for the sake of your name. God, instead, lead us to be people who are firmly aware that we should expect to suffer for following Jesus. So that when that day comes, we can stand firm in faith that our God is good and worthy of all that we may suffer. God, we pray that in as many ways as possible, we can be spared those types of hardships. But God, we know that that won't last forever. But our salvation in you will Help us to lean on you more and more every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we close.